I saw Rowan and Emily. I think I counted five board members. Hi, Rowan. So I think we're good to go. And it is five o'clock. Um, so uh, Dr. Sue, uh, do you agree? Are we ready to roll? Yes, we are. We are prepared to, to proceed, Chair. Okay. All right. Um, good evening, everyone, and welcome. It is September 28th, and we start this evening at five o'clock in a work session. Uh, this is regarding first reading of board policy JHH, student, student suicide prevention review. And Director Ebert, I will hand it off to you to introduce the team. Um, thank you. All right, well, uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you for being here today um, to discuss a required policy that um, came in our most recent update. Um, and I'm going to have uh, Carol Kinch introduce her team uh, that has pulled together to um, get all of the uh, resources that we have been using and also discuss um, new additional resources um, that we've pulled together uh, to present to you this, uh, this evening, gave us an opportunity to organize it all in one document um, to go with this policy. And so I will have Carol take over and introduce her team and we'll move forward. Uh, thank you, good evening, everybody. I'm actually just going to pass it off to Heidi Dawkins, who is our new Associate Director of Student Services, uh, not new to the district, but it was a nice opportunity for uh, her to reintroduce herself to many of you and then introduce the team that she brought today to discuss the policy and the corresponding plan. So Heidi. All right, thank you. Good evening, everybody. I know some of you, not all of you. Um, so I'm Heidi Dawkins, the new Associate Director of Student Services. Um, like Carol said, I've been in the district for a while, I think over 20 years now, um, mostly in special ed with the last four years on being the associate principal at Tuolity Middle School. Um, so I'm going to introduce our team here in just a minute who's been working on this plan, but I wanted to start um, by saying that Alyssa Anderson, who um, was one of our TOSA school psychologists and student services um, last year, really was sort of the in-building expert, in-house expert for our district um, on this topic and is no longer with us. Um, so we have pulled together a team and we have been doing some new learning and um, gathering all of our resources and bringing all of her work. And uh, there's been a lot of work done, but just gathering it, bringing it all together to share with, with you all tonight. So um, like any plan, it's in a draft form right now. And um, there are some things we feel that we have pretty solid in place and some things um, that could use some improvement and some recommendations as well um, at the end. So um, Bobby Brown is one of our school psychologists in student services who is actually transitioning into a new role now at Bridgeport Elementary as a Dean of students there. Um, but she was really instrumental in gathering all of this work and putting it together in one place for us. Um, so she's part of this team, Alfonso, Ramirez is our new trauma-informed restorative practices coordinator. Um, and I know that he did a lot of this work with Alyssa last year and um, has some experience and expertise in this area and other roles as well. Lindsay Pratt is our PBIS coordinator in student services who is um, now going to be taking on some more mental health topics with us um, with Alyssa gone and Bobby transitioning. And then I wanted to introduce also Michaela Brewer. Is she here with us? Okay, great. I um, can't see everybody on the screen. Um, Michaela Brewer is one of our health teachers at Tuolity Middle School who um, implements and teaches the SOS curriculum. So um, with that, I am going to hand it over to Bobby to um, get us started on the plan. And, and I'm hoping that everybody has had a chance to Take a look at the plan. Okay. Um, so. Ready for me? Yep, I think okay. we're ready. Hey everyone, I hope you're having a good evening. Um, I What I was hoping to do is talk through the process that we went through to develop this 
so that it will provide some context as we talk through it. Um, and we were really fortunate in that Alyssa and Alfonso had already done so much legwork in this process. So we were really able to take from their work and provide, help us provide a structure to describe this, you know, this process and this policy. So the way that we organized this document, and should I share the document or does everyone just have it on the screen, on their own screen, what would be best? If you could share it um, that way, I'm not sure who all is watching. I think it's just helpful if you guys are okay with that. Um, I think to have it up on the screen is important. So. Yeah, do you, Bobby, do you want me to share it? So that would that be great. Yes. Um, okay. Is, so we're sorry, looking was this plan. something that was made, sent to us? Because I do not have it. Um, I'm so glad that you said that, Director um, Emerson. I was just uh, texting Dr. Ricky Smith and then in a panic that I missed it in an email. So we have the policy that defines all the plan steps. We did not receive the actual plan. So I assumed that was the purpose of the work session. So thank you, Director Emerson. So is that a, a disconnect or just a reference of words? It was supposed to be in a link. Debbie, do you know what happened to the link? Uh, Patty, do you know where the link is? I am going to my, I, I'm trying to find it. Okay. Well, she and I will try to find it in the meantime. Can somebody, could somebody put it up on the screen? Yeah, it looks yeah, like and Lindsay just sent the link also. Okay. Yeah. Um, and if that, um, Lindsay, I don't know if you have board emails, if that could be sent to our emails as well. Um, that would be good for us to have. Uh, I don't, but um, I can- uh, Send it to Patty, okay. please, please. <laughs> Sorry. So can now everybody see my screen that says suicide prevention, intervention, postvention? Okay. Okay, great. So um, what we, what we put together was um, we wanted to talk about both how we are what actions the district is taking in terms of prevention. Then we wanted to highlight um, the interventions that we currently have in place and then also any actions that we would need to take in terms of postvention were are included in this document. And then um, as I believe Heidi mentioned, we also did have some recommendations. So as we were looking through the bill, um, we were we went from line to line to fill in the pieces that we have in place and then also to really clearly define what we're missing at this time and what we would suggest we should add um, so that we're you know we're doing the best that we can in this area. So in terms of suicide prevention, we really broke this down by what we currently offer. Um, that is preventative at each element, elementary, middle, and high school level. So all the levels that we have available that we're currently offering in district. So like some of those examples would be the PACs, good behavior game, second steps, caring school communities. Those are all already in place in our elementary. And when we were when we looked at secondary, we discovered that um, we're using the SOS curriculum, signs of suicide. Um, in to, for students in middle and high school age for students. And then also we wanted to emphasize what sorts of professional development opportunities we have available for, for uh, people in the building who provide mental health supports. And that um, we also really wanted to focus on um, all TTSD employees having access to this knowledge. And that's one of the areas that we um, were recommending would, should happen. Although we have a, a, you know, we have a system in place to support mental health providers where it's not as clear to all employees working in the district um, about what they can, what signs they could be looking for and also just to increase their knowledge of the topic. And then also we were hoping um, at, to have more community um, education around this topic. Um, and that was another recommendation. We also have care coordination already in the district, which really helps us along um, at all levels. And then we also noted um, the community and school supports that we have in place to, um, in particular, to access students who are more at risk for suicide. Um, and so we included that in the document. Um, we were also looking at um, how this 
these processes and um, policies can be culturally and linguistically responsive. Um, and so we really talked a lot about utilizing equity coordinators and culturally responsive staff that we have available to us in the buildings. So at a point in time, if we are, we have concerns about a student who is potentially at risk of completing suicide or presenting with suicidal ideations, um, we uh, went ahead and talked about, we included the information that, we're, that we do. So um, we were able to access our suicide screening procedures, our, how we interview students and families, um, the collaboration we have with outside providers um, so that we are able to um, intervene if needed in a school building. Then we also included suicide postvention and this would include the situation at which a student um, was did not complete a suicide, but we are welcoming them back into our school community and um, how we want to collaborate with outside providers to make sure that we have a plan in place to prevent future incidences of happening. And then in the sad case that a student completes suicide, we also included information around how we intervene with a flight team response. Um, and so we have that really solidly in place. And that can include supporting the school, um, supporting families and, um, and all of the, the great work that people do when we are, have to initiate flight team, a flight team intervention. And then we also just had some notes around safe messaging around suicide and what that should look like um, to be really clear about to do that in the safest ways. And then some of the resources that we currently have um, available to us that we're knowledgeable about, um, which includes Washington County resources, the Hawthorne Walk-In Center, Safe Oregon, Oregon Youth Line. We also included that as references in this document. And then we also did have some parent resources in there, um, both in English and Spanish, and that we can access as well. And then I and then the rest of this document really also includes recommendations that we have for moving forward to fully implement this policy. And some of our recommendations at this time, like I mentioned earlier, would include um, professional development around um, suicide prevention district wide. A, year, a few years back, we uh, school psychologists and school counselors and um, care coordinators participated in assist training, and that was put on by Washington County, and that was a really fabulous um, uh, PD. It, it took a couple days, and we our recommendation at this time is that we um, when we're onboarding people that they have access to the full training and for people who have already completed it that they're able to have, um, you know, like a refresher course at least every year. We really felt like one of the holes in this was that um, the community resources to inform families and educate families isn't as inclusive as we would like it to be. And that would include um, using, you know, having materials in multiple languages so that school buildings can share this information with families and that TTSD's website is also being really um, accessible to families that are in need. We also wanted to create a standardized process or form, which um, is part of that postvention step. So if students are coming back to us from um, experiencing um, a, a, a potential either suicidal ideation or the returning from hospitalization, that it's really clear about how we're collaborating with out of district therapists or psychologists or physicians to welcome the student back. We also uh, wanted to make sure that we have a campaign for students staff and family so that we can increase um, our knowledge about prevention and also make it really clear what supports we have in place if we are encountering a situation where students need additional supports around suicide prevention and intervention. And then of course our references, some of the sources we went to to gather some of this information is in the document as well. Thank you, Bobby. And I just wanna, I, I you, you mentioned it at the beginning, but the what the team did was looked at the policy and made sure that the plan had everything that was in the policy. But you all have the policy, right? So I can stop sharing. 
I can see everybody. So knowing this is a work session, we wanted to make sure you had opportunities to ask questions. Um, you, and that's why we brought the team here. Um, Director Pinch, thank you. I, um, I um, am disappointed about disconnects happen, you know, all the time. And so I understand that. Um, but if board members are like me, I'm going to shut that screen. I'd like to read and process, think about it, ask questions. So I'm kind of on the fly trying to um, pick this up. Um, and um, this is a critical uh, topic. Um, so I don't want to take it lightly. And I want to take advantage of all of you being here uh, for us to have a good conversation. So um, setting that, I'm, I will open it up to um, Rowan, Emily, fellow board members. And Eddie, are you, is Eddie here? Um, I don't think so. Okay, we'll meet him or he'll join us at a regular board session. Uh, but anyway, open it up. I'll let board members and Rowan and Emily um, start with questions while I fix my blind. I have a question about the elementary um, where um, the curriculums were, were specifically three different um, curriculums are listed. And especially since the Caring School Community says Byram only, I was wondering um, if there was, I, don't, I guess I'm thinking of other, um, oh shoot, other new curriculums where there are set lessons, like four lessons a year or something like that. And I'm wondering if we have some kind of plan like that so that we know that all first graders hear the same message at periodically through the year or I, I can speak to that if you'd like. Wonderful. <laughs> um, no problem. Um, so at elementary, uh, we have primarily second step is the curriculum. Um, PACS is actually not a curriculum. It's a um, classroom kind of structural system that we've trained all of our elementary staff in. Um, so it's just kind of a way to set up a classroom, a way to set up norms with your kids, that kind of thing. It's actually not a lesson structure, but it has been shown to really increase sort of social emotional skills by having those kinds of structures in class. So we count that as one of our preventative supports because um, it's really good for that kind of thing. Um, the two curriculums that we do have, second step is used in nine out of the 10. And that's really what you're talking about is it's an actual explicit series of lessons. And every year counselors um, create a lesson schedule and send that out to teachers so that everybody knows week two, we're all doing this one in first grade, for example. Um, and those are considered the core. Now, last year, or I, maybe two years ago, I guess, um, Byram uh, had some people on staff that were really interested in piloting a different uh, really specified uh, lesson curriculum called Caring School Communities that also has a really good research base. Um, and Second Steps does as well. It's still one of the more highly rated ones. Um, and they wanted to try to pilot that. And that one is done in a series of daily shorter lessons um, in kind of a morning meeting format. So they have just sort of replaced on kind of a trial basis uh, their second step lessons with the caring community ones. And, and the only thing I would add, thank you, Lindsay, is that um, as we were going through our comprehensive SEL, uh, it was on our our agenda to look at our elementary SEL curriculum, um, including looking at whether we wanted to expand caring school communities to other schools, but then COVID hit. <laughs> so we still have second steps and teachers do teach it um, a bit inconsistently. So, um, and caring school communities was implemented pretty fully last year until March. I have a similar question for middle school or excuse me, secondary signs of suicide. Is that one that's implemented um, or has it been implemented for a while or is that something new? Maybe Heidi could start that and then McKaylee could tell you what it's like as a teacher. Yeah, I, sorry, my phone just came on. Um, so that has, is, has been implemented at the middle school and the high school level for, I, not exactly sure on the years, I wanna say the last three years. Um, and it is um, is taught every other year at the middle school and at the high school and health too. So Mika and Mikaeli, do you wanna talk a little bit more about what that's like in the classroom? Um, yeah, I can do that. And I would say 
just thinking about, I, this is my fifth year at Tuality and I've had the SOS curriculum the whole time I've been there. I can't speak for the other middle schools and I don't know about the teacher before me. Um, I guess like coming into this meeting, I didn't know exactly what it was about. So I, I have, I can talk about what the curriculum looks like and what's included in it. And is that what you're looking for? Yeah, yeah I was just, yeah, thank you. Okay. I just didn't want to go off on a tangent if that's not, if it wasn't helpful. Um, so just to, just to put it out so everyone knows the SOS curriculum in the form that I have it was just some physical materials that were in my classroom. I have not ever had any training in it and I don't know that any of the other middle school teachers have. Um, that's something I wanted to bring up. It was just physical materials. Um, so there's um, some of the main parts of it. There is a, a video that is um, goes through a lot of um, signs and symptoms of depression and suicide, as well as um, the big um, the skill for the SOS curriculum is what they call the ACT strategy, acknowledge, care, tell, and it's um, steps for helping, not helping, but for recognizing and getting help for somebody who is showing those signs. And that's um, the main focus of the curriculum. Um, the I would say at the middle school level, the materials are really like two days of class is how long they last. Um, and so I don't, there's really not any alignment between the middle schools and health, honestly. So I don't know what the other schools do, but I have supplemented that with a lot of other things to make it a more robust unit and to provide more practice with that um, strategy. But that has all just kind of been me. And um, again, without training and just doing my own research. Um, so that I just want to be really clear about that I don't I don't think we have a consistent curriculum across the middle schools, um, and yeah, and I don't know how long that curriculum has been around. So uh, that's kind of that's the overview of it. It is fairly um, I think in terms of the of health materials, the the video is 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 fairly current and is appropriate for middle school and has good things in it. Um, I don't have access though to any, like I don't know if there's an updated version, I don't have a digital login for it. So that's kind of all I have is just those physical materials that were in my classroom. Um, I have lots of other thoughts about the unit that I'd be happy to share, but I'll stop talking now and you can come back to me if you want to. I was just curious, is it for, focused um, on um, students recognizing the signs each other and themselves is that kind of the whole purpose is just to recognize if you're depressed or if you have a friend and then what to do is that kind of the focus of the yeah i would say so and i think yeah. that it actually does do a pretty good job of talking about the ways that depression can look really different in different individuals um and then how you can um different ways that you can go about getting them to an adult um and i actually I would be curious, and I've heard that the high school version is pretty similar in terms of what it covers, although it's at a different level, I, but I haven't seen it. The two students in the room might be able to speak more to what they learned in their middle school health classes. They were both my students, so I feel very comfortable calling them out here. Um, but yeah, the high school one's very similar as well. Alfonso might be able to speak to the high school one as well. I think that's uh, probably pretty similar. It's taught uh, two times, once in health class and health class one, and then in health two. And um, students get an opportunity to take those two classes uh, two times, either their ninth, 10th or 11th grade year. But it's very similar where it's a, a day or two of the, of the curriculum that's provided. And I don't know that there, anyone's received any particular training in it, um, but they do have the curriculum that they uh, review. Rowan or Emily, you guys have anything to add on that? I have some questions, um, but I don't, I don't, uh, I haven't done health two yet. So I have yet to experience that curriculum. And I do remember a lot about the signs of depression unit. I 
we did go over it, but health in middle school goes quite fast. So after two years, I don't remember what I, all of it. <laughs> um, is it okay if I go through the questions or Rowan, do you wanna talk about your experiences in middle school or high school? Um, well, I would just say going back to middle school is way too far back for me to remember specific curriculum. Um, but, and I also took health too as a sophomore. So I'm two years removed from both of those. Um, so I, I can't speak much to the curriculum. I, I don't remember it being particularly bad or, um, anything like that, but I can't really speak much to it now. Go ahead, Emily, and ask your questions. Um, for you, have, there's a section, the point five on the program recommendations uh, says that each year the district will implement a suicide prevention awareness campaign. Do, are you hoping to partner with uh, certain groups? Would that be like a school wide rollout or would you just target uh, specific groups and do you have specific activities that you want to do other than those listed on the link? So I would say that that's a recommendation and we would need to start partnering with students, especially at the high school with student groups and counselors. Um, and then what I, what I believe the team was noticing was that we do these little pockets of things, but we wanna make sure that all students know the signs of depression and who to call and who to report to if they ever need to, or if they have a, have a friend that's struggling, who do you go to? And um, once a year, like Ms. Brewer was talking about, or once every other year didn't feel like enough. So it's a, a recommendation to get started. I would love to hear your ideas. Do you have other questions, Emily? Do you want I can speak a little bit to what we were hoping for when we were going through this section? So what we really wanted to have happen was that we wanted a general rollout so that um, all students were able to receive materials on this topic. Um, and we hadn't really decided if we wanted to do it periodically throughout the year or if it was going to be like a one big campaign. And then we also really wanted to target groups um, that might could potentially be more at risk. So we talked a lot about accessing affinity groups and clubs in particular um, and connecting with the advisors of those clubs and those groups so that we could get additional information out. To, um, to those smaller groups as well. So um, that was as far as we had gotten, but um, we also had conversations around having visuals throughout in a school building, specific school building, so that there's more awareness out there that's being seen and experienced, you know, beyond the curriculum. So that's what we were hoping for, but clear, I mean, there's a lot of pieces in there that we, we're just guessing would be helpful. So it's really, I mean, if you all feel like that makes sense or if there's more information you can provide with us that would be more effective, that would be great to hear from you. I have a few more questions, but I don't wanna, Director Bowman or Emerson or anybody else has questions, I don't wanna hog the floor, but, um, I, um, I was wondering where you all think the gaps are in the plan. You talked about some of your concerns um, earlier. And um, I know one of mine is just the um, lack of mental health providers in our community, uh, especially for pediatrics. And um, I know even in our own school-based health centers, we're having a lot of problems finding anybody at all. And, um, and also I've heard you know some things from um, our current contract um, with the care managers that um, even that, those, you know, there's a lot of turnover and so not a lot of consistency for our students in terms of um, the same provider. So I've heard those concerns, but I just wanted your insights on this. I'm sure you've discussed it and whatnot. What, what's your take and what might be some solutions for us moving forward in that area? You guys have any ideas or thoughts? I'm gonna let Heidi and Bobby and Alfonso who 
did a kind of a needs assessment as they came on board and Alyssa and Laura left. Um, Cause I, I'm, I know that they've been thinking about that. Yeah. So I'll start us off with a couple of things and then um, I'll hand it off to for everybody else to have a chance. I think one of the things is that we talked about, you know, some of the trainings um, have not it been as consistent across our staff or, you know, as, as we would like them to be. So um, having our, our trainings be really consistent for our staff, our assist trainings. Um, and then um, I know another thing is just making um, our community resources available to our families. And kind of, like you said, it can be really difficult to find services. And so something that we're working on is our, um, alongside of this also is our mental health uh, resource guide and trying to make that really clear for our, our staff and our families and everybody to access and to use and to find the supports that they need. Um, so I, I hear you on that one. I would agree with you and we're, and we're working on, on that as well alongside of this. Um, so let's see, I'll hand it off to Alfonso. Yeah, I'll, I'll just start by saying, um, having worked and overseen some of the suicide efforts that um, has been taking care uh, taking taking place across the state I will say that Washington County in general and Tiger 12 school district is one of the better districts um, they have a flight team they have um, resources for students so um, that that said though um, what I see is the sort of the gaps is that there's not a universal training for all our staff and students to know how to how to uh, talk about suicide, how to support uh, suicide. A lot of that training is held with um, specialist positions, counselors, psychiatrists, but not um, the average um, administrative assistant. Uh, and from hearing from the students, we could do a better job of making that more of a um, universal understanding among, among our students because they're often the first to hear when there are troubles with their peers. So partnering with them, I think would be uh, really important and advocating for more, um, more workforce development. I mean, it's, it is really challenging to get um, mental health staff uh, to stay in a, a student-based health center for a long time. I'm really appreciative that you mentioned that, Director Fox. Um, and I don't quite know the answer to that. There's um, that's a statewide problem. It's a national problem, but I think uh, whatever we can do to attend to that and invite practitioners into our community and, and let them know how uh, we partner with them, uh, how we value what, what they do, uh, I think is something that could possibly help. Bobby, did you want to add anything or Lindsay before I, I have a couple things? Sure. I mean, I did. Um, and, and, I, th this may just be like one of those pie in the sky ideas, but I'll throw it out there because it's been mentioned from time to time, is that, you know, there are some of the issues around the health base, um, the school based health centers and retaining mental health providers is that they're not TTSD employees. And so since they're contract employees, it's hard to be able to like really collaborate, like say through student services so that we're you know, like building those relationships with people to really retain people over time, they're really operating on their own. And so um, it really makes sense that they are not, you know, they're not sticking around. It is hard to find them and then it's also hard to retain them. So I, I think in what I'm hearing is that a lot of people w wonder whether or not having a tighter tie to TTSD would make sense for those mental health providers because they really I mean, their pay is quite low. That's my understanding that they are, you know, they're just like really doing their best. So like maybe if we think about how to bring them in and support them a little more, um, I think that might make a big difference. So the only thing, a couple things I would add on. One is um, I think an area that we need to consider is culturally responsive uh, mental health providers because, you know, you're, your mental health is very um, unique and dependent upon your culture and your community and your family. And um, we don't have a lot of people who can offer support for families that might be different than um, the white middle-class family. So that is really a, 
a piece that I think countywide, statewide, we're all trying to figure out. The other thing that I think about is, um, you know, I, we're always talking about our triangle, right? So we, you know, build skills. And then we always know that there's going to be some people who need a little bit more. So they need, need just more connection with more support. Um, and so sometimes when we lean on whether we have that mental health provider, we forget all the other things that we can do to make someone feel like they belong to part of a community and they have someone to talk to. And then we have some people who will always need support. Um, and so our job as a community, a family or a community is to support that person, understand you know, the triggers, understand the signs and be able to wrap around them. Um, and we can do some of that in our school environments. Um, our circle work is the beginning of that. Um, having students understand how to support each other, not on their own, how, how to access teachers and counselors in our school sites. Um, I, I feel like that's a really important way to think about mental health. Um, we all know that we have times where we need a little extra help. Um, so it's not always that six, you get six sessions and then you're all better because that's typically not the way it works. So um, Director Kinch, I have um, a follow-up question for that. How do you find the balance? So we support that, you know, to Rowan and to Emily, those kind of touches in middle school or early in high school, they're not going to stay with you as you go through um, high school. So how do you find the balance that you really are educating and, and helping our students and our staff be aware that the triggers, how do I jump in for support, but that you aren't so focused on, this is everything about suicide, right? So that it's just always kind of right there in plain sight. And I, I say that in the greatest respect, right? But, but you know, I think about 13 reasons or, or that balance of how do you educate, but you, you know, maintain the perspective. So just curious about that. Well, I think this is a good one for Lindsay because we think about young children and we don't usually say we're doing suicide prevention right now. Um, but I think what we do for young children is the same thing we do for all of us. We don't, I mean, suicide is a, an outcome of something of mental health, um, sadly, right? But we all have mental health and we all have need coping strategies and have times where we need to use those coping strategies. Um, so I think the balance is skill building, normalizing that we struggle sometimes um, and that we need to support the people and those of us who might struggle more. Lindsay, would you add anything to it? No, you no that was exactly where my head was going. I, um, at the very top of this document, we put in, um, you know, what are the things that sort of prevent against suicide? And they're all the things that we're trying to build in our schools, naturally just through some of our mental health training with kids. Um, I think teaching mental health is a skill and thinking of it as a skill and something that we all work on um, and that we all go through sort of like Carol said, times where we struggle with it and need a little more support and maybe times when we're doing well um, is huge. Uh, I think even naming it and talking about it with kids, making sure that they feel welcome in their school communities and have connections with peers and with adults there that they feel like understand them, understand their families um, and know what they need. Uh, I think is it going to be a huge factor in suicide prevention for us. We could hire, and I do think we need more mental health support. Um, as Sharon said, I think that's absolutely true. But I also um, think that there's so much uh, good work to be done in prevention and creating a sense of safety for our kids. If I, if I can just add to that as well, I think um, where the balance is, is that, it, that we really lean towards hope. We lean towards uh, talking about our feelings, talking about um, how to get help. The main issue with 13 Reasons Why is that it, it's centered around uh, the death of, a, of an adolescent and the story and, you know, they get to keep living, they get to tell their story. And it's really just a negative sort of message that somehow there's, there's value in uh, completing a suicide. Uh, once someone completes a suicide, that's it. It's over. There's no storytelling after that. It's really a huge, huge and devastating loss. And I think if we're going to uh, have a balance, we really want that balance to lean towards conversation, towards hope, to building skills, um, to helping people reach out to each other and support each other. I think that's where um, suicide prevention can be really, really effective.
Um, Alfonso, thank you. I mean, thank you all, right? That kind of flip perspective, um, I appreciate um, uh, hearing that, so thank you. And um, Alfonso, I, I appreciate the, oh, sorry, Ben, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I just wanted to follow up on that. I appreciate your comment a lot about hope, um, I think is a huge factor. Um, I lost my sister to suicide years ago. Hope, um, purpose, meaning are huge. Um, and I appreciate that in the suicide prevention, you have protective factors on your list. Um, because I think my joke is that we're all mentally ill at one time or another or at various levels, right? And so um, those protective factors, the resiliency is huge. Um, one thing I would like to see, and this is based on a conversation I had with a counselor. I know for those of you who've been around for a while, um, was it 2016, 2017, we had like three attempted suicides all in one year and one was um, one carried through and devastating, absolutely devastating. Um, and so I was just, you know, I was a mentor with some of the students. So I knew a lot of the counselors at the time and we were talking about hope, purpose, meaning. And she said, I wish, I know we're a public institution, but I wish I, I tell my students to go seek out their faith. And that was really refreshing because I don't think we talk about that enough. Um, and like in, the, in here in the resiliency factors, it says cultural and religious belief that discourage suicide support instincts I would, go, I would go above that and say, rather than discourage suicide, it provides hope, purpose, and meaning in our lives. And um, as you know, surrounded by so many different faith-based organizations, uh, synagogues, mosques, whatnot, um, if there's any way we can you know, lawfully refer kids to seek that out or seek it out on their own. Because um, it was a really thoughtful conversation. And this was a, a counselor who was an atheist. <laughs> So, um, which I thought that was interesting. But uh, anyway, I just wanted to add that and I appreciate that Alphonse because I, I totally resonate with that. Um, just knowing my own sister's situation of hopelessness. Thank you. Thanks for sharing that with us. Yeah, and I, I appreciate everything that you just said, um, Director Fox. And I'm really sorry to hear about your sister. I'm sorry that that's such a tough loss. And thanks for all that you do. For us, for us here in the district. And Kaylee, why don't you jump in here? Thanks, I just don't wanna interrupt the protocol and I'm not on the panel who's been doing all this work for, it sounds like a long time. Uh, I just think um, as a teacher and also I am one of the teachers at Tuality who facilitates the um, LB, LGBTQ Alliance so like some different lenses into student frustrations that I think are important to be heard. Um, we have a lot of students and I don't know if this is a, a cultural shift that's happened really recently, but since I was in high school, a lot more students are talking about mental health and it's part of the conversation in ways that it wasn't for me, um, which is really awesome. So now what I hear a lot from students is that when they do have concerns, and they do try to access the resources in school that they feel very frustrated that there aren't resources in school. And, and the school-based health centers are amazing and absolutely resources for families. But like, I'm thinking of one student who was not out to their parents, so couldn't explain why they needed to go to a therapist. Feelings of suicide, like these things, I'm like getting a little choked up. Like we need more in schools is what I'm hearing from students. And I just haven't heard that in this conversation. Um, and our counseling staff is so overburdened, like unbelievably, they don't always have time to meet with students when they are needed. And so I just wanted to bring that up. You were like reading my mind, McKaylee, because I was thinking of some, a student at Tiger to hire, somebody was asking about you know, kids are telling us that they would like to be able to have someone to talk to and that they can't access always. Thank you for, for sharing that, McKaylee, and, and Sharon and McKaylee both for bringing the, the personal side into this and telling those personal experiences, I think is really important to remember when we're talking about a subject like this. Um, one, one question I've been wondering about or thinking about is, I know in the, in the sort of ed policy world, there's like, always complaints about how FERPA and HIPAA don't talk to each other. 
and it's hard to sort of crosswalk the, the privacy regulations between healthcare and education. Um, but some districts have had some success, I understand, um, in um, like voluntary disclosures or partnerships with healthcare organizations um, or healthcare providers. And I'm wondering, in our care coordination, we talk about this a little bit, but can, can someone describe for me if we have, um, if we do have knowledge that a student um, is experiencing su suicidal ideations, um, how is that information used in the school? Are, are teachers knowing about that? So they're aware of warning signs. Um, are parents contacted so that parents can be aware of it? Does it depend on certain factors in a situ in a given circumstance? Um, I'm just hoping someone can walk, walk me through that and help me understand a little better. Well, well Liz is gonna go, go, go. Um, I, I can speak to that as a former count school counselor at the elementary level in a middle school psych. Um, so uh, when you have a kid that um, states to someone that um, they are considering suicide, um, typically what happens is that you, uh, you go to them and you complete what's called a suicide screening. Um, and there's a series of kind of standard questions on there that um, is meant to assess sort of where they are in their thinking about that. Um, and I think it's linked in this document that we shared as well. So you could go in there if you want and see the specific questions. But um, what happens from there is that um, typically, unless you have some specific reason that you would not contact a, like if the parent was a cause of something that was going on or something like that, you might contact DHS directly, but typically what you do at that point is you call a parent and you make a safety plan um, for that kid. So uh, that would really walk through like, um, you know, what is this child's plan? If they are feeling anxious, what are we going to do to prevent this from happening? Um, who is um, supposed to be responsible for this kid? Like how do they get to and from school? What is the plan when they are at school? And then depending on what that plan at school looks like, um, you would have a protocol in place with their teachers as well. So if this, so that then those teachers would need, um, would be informed of that on a need to know basis because you don't want to have that information too widely spread. It's really private, but also you need their teachers to know that if that kid needs a break um, or uh, ask for some kind of support that they get that immediately. So that, that's typically how those things go. That's, that's super helpful. Um, and so I guess my, my, my follow-up question on that is, so if that student or that student's family gets referred to a mental health provider, mm -hmm. um, are there ways that a counselor and a therapist can communicate with each other and like, you know, monitor the situation or how does that, what's that relationship? Yeah, like? absolutely. So um, typically after we go through getting a kid connected to care coordination, whether um, it was due to, su to suicidal ideation or not, um, typically we um, assign like a HIPAA form so that we can talk to each other. And um, it's really helpful. I have found um, for, uh, counselors and uh, like private counselors and school counselors to use kind of the same language. If a kid has a specific thing that they're working on or practicing or a family has a certain language around something that we're all kind of talking about it in the same way and referencing it in both environments. Um, Cause what you typically see with almost any skill is that kids won't, um, if you teach it in a certain environment over here kids won't generalize it to the other one unless you're also talking about it in a similar way in that other environment as well. So um, that's something that counselors do a lot is talk to private uh, care providers and make sure that they're kind of on the same page. Thank you for sharing that, I really appreciate it. No and I can add a, a t an additional piece just also coming from the perspective of someone who's completed this process with students mm -hmm. is that um, there's, you know, Lindsay mentioned the, um, you know, consent to communicate with outside providers and the school staff. And that's a really important piece. So oftentimes if a student, um, if we complete a suicide screening process, we wanna make sure that we are connecting with an out of school provider so that we know that when we send that student home, that the families are getting directly in contact with their mental health provider or a physician. And then when they come back that we're using, um, you know, medical orders, or we're getting consultation around the plan that we're going to put in place. So when they come back, 
we are like the communication lines between home and school are really, really solid and that we're not taking that on alone as a school staff, that we're getting as much um, support from the students out of district provider. And so you usually, I mean, the situation always is that's an essential step in having students come back to school safely. Thank you. So it looks like our time is up. I wanna apologize that you didn't have that link ahead of time and offer for any of us to speak with any, you know, you could come to one of our team meetings. I know you all can't come at the same time, but we're happy to meet with you. Um, we appreciate all the, the time that you've taken today because it is such an important subject um, and important that we, you know, whenever we have an opportunity to shine the light on a piece of our work, it offers us opportunities to improve. So McKaylee's highlighted some things, Bobby and Lindsay and Heidi and Alfonso have made some recommendations. So our next step is to continue on and um, follow through with those recommendations. So, um, Director Kinch, thank you. And, and McKaylee and to the whole team, um, I, um, you know, we'll all get caught up with our reading and I'm certain if we have questions, we'll follow up. But I just so appreciate the honest conversation, right? And um, just what's going well, where are the holes and um, that anyone um, really to jump into this conversation with the questions and, thinking about how we can improve. Um, I'm just grateful for that. So yeah, so we filled the time. Um, and I, I, I guess the last question, um, you know, what else do you need from the board? I heard a couple things around PD. How do we ensure stronger mental health supports for our students? Um, and just some of those pieces. So uh, certainly um, Vice Chair Bowman and I can chat with Dr. Ricky Smith about what are those follow-ups, right? How do we know this is rolling out? I think about um, a mental health day or campaign. I think about Unity Day. I just think we have to figure out in this um, remote world how we do these pieces really well and figure out how we start you know, connecting these um, conversations with our students. And I don't wanna lose sight of that. Um, and we hit winter break when we go, ah, we didn't do this because it's really, really critical. So just appreciate everybody's time. And I'll just open it up to the rest of the board if you guys have any final um, thought you wanted to share. Chair Wolf, I, I would just add too that we do have a, one set of brackets on the policy that um, we should decide if we want to keep. Of course, there's always brackets. <laughs> so. That's what I was going to say. <laughs> Yeah, so it's the uh, second paragraph. Uh, so if you could take a look and just let me know if you would like that language to remain in the policy or if you don't think we need it, we can take it out. I personally don't think we need it. I don't think it adds significantly. Um, and based on what I've, I've heard this evening, I think we're already, we have plans in place that blow this policy away, quite, quite frankly. <laughs> so that's just my two cents. I don't think we need it, and I don't think we need footnote two either. Director Fox, Director Bowman, I, I'm you guys' thoughts. I concur with Zertzmead and um, Emerson. So I agreed. Um, although, Director Emerson, did you say um, footnote two? I don't see a second footnote on mine. Oh, on the second page. Bottom of the page, ODE will. Is that optional? But is that a bad thing? I don't know that that's. And number eight, a process for designating staff to be trained in an evidence based suicide prevention program. ODE will provide a list of available. Oh, programs. there it is. There it is. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree on the bracketed um, text above. Um, but yeah, I agree on, we don't, I don't think that's critical. I don't think it's critical, but I'd rather just assume keep it if it's not, because it's not bracketed. I don't know what the, I don't know which state law this is coming out of. So I'd rather keep the footnote, even though it does seem kind of. Yes. Because it doesn't say that you shall use it, right? It just says they'll provide the resource. So. Uh, right. It seems optional, but it, yeah, I don't know. Director Fox, any thoughts? Um, okay, okay, so I'm hearing that we're going to 
we're going to take out all the language in the second paragraph, but leave the footnote yeah. in number eight. Wherever that is. Okay. All right. Very good. Okay. okay. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Thanks Director Ebert. Um, okay. Any further thoughts or? Okay, with that 555, um, we will um, adjourn this work session and we will see um, most of you back at 630. Uh, so thank you all, it was great um, conversation. Director Bowman uh, just acknowledged that as well. So truly thank you all very much um, and um, have a good quick dinner. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>